Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of The Reading Corner with Moose Changer Pat. That's me, in case you're wondering. Today, we are reading Chapter 11 of Queen of Sorcery by David Eddings, and as always, you should support the original work by buying the original book. Chapter 11 A moment of dreadful silence filled the throne room following the death of Natchak. Then the two members of his bodyguard, who were still on their feet, threw their weapons down on the blood-splattered floor with a sudden clatter. Mandarallan raised his visor and turned toward the throne. Sire, he said respectfully, the treachery of Natchak stands proved by reason of this trial at arms. Truly, the king agreed, my only regret is that thy enthusiasm in pursuing this cause have deprived us of the opportunity to probe more deeply into the full extent of Natchak's duplicity. I expect that the plots he hatched will dry up once word of what happened here gets around, Mr. Wolf observed. Perhaps so, the king acknowledged. I would have pursued the matter further, however. I would know if this villainy was Natchak's own, or if I must look beyond him to Tar Urgas himself. He frowned thoughtfully, then shook his head as if to put certain dark speculations aside. Arendia stands in, stands in thy debt, ancient Elgarath. This brave company of thine hath forestalled the renewal of a war best forgotten. He looked sadly at the blood-smeared floor and the bodies littering it. My throne room hath become as a battlefield. The curse of Arendia extends even here. He sighed. Have it cleansed, he ordered shortly, and turned his head so that he would not have to watch the grim business of cleaning up. The nobles and ladies began to buzz as the dead were removed, and the polished stone floor was quickly mopped to remove the pools of sticky blood. Good fight, Barrack commented as he carefully wiped his axe blade. I am in thy debt, Lord Barrack, Mandarallan said gravely. Thy aid was fortuitous. Barrack shrugged. Seemed appropriate. Hedder joined them, his expression one of grim satisfaction. You did a nice job on that, Jack, Barrack complimented him. I've had a lot of practice, Hedder answered. Mergos always seem to make that mis same mistake when they get into a fight. I think there's a gap in their training somewhere. That's a shame, isn't it? Barrack suggested with vast insincerity. Garion moved away from them. Although he knew it was irrational, he nonetheless felt a keen sense of personal responsibility for the carnage he had just witnessed. The blood and violent death had come about as a result of his words. Had he not spoken, men who were now dead would still be alive. No matter how he justified, how necessary his speaking out had been, he still suffered the pangs of guilt. He did not, at the moment, trust himself to speak with his friends. More than anything, he wished that he could talk with Aunt Paul. But she had not yet returned to the throne room, and so he was left to wrestle alone with his wounded conscience. He reached one of the embrasures formed by the buttresses along the south wall of the throne room and stood alone in somber reflection, until a girl, perhaps two years older than he, glided across the floor toward him, her stiff crimson brocade gown rustling. The girl's hair was dark, even black, and her skin was creamy. Her bodice was cut quite low, and Garion found some difficulty in finding a safe place for his eyes as she bore down on him. I would add my thanks to the thanks of all Rendia, Lord Garion. She breathed at him. Her voice was vibrant with all kinds of emotions, none of which Garion understood. Thy timely revelation of the Murgo's plotting hath in truth saved the life of our sovereign. Garion felt a certain warmth at that. I, I didn't do all that much, my lady, he replied with a somewhat insincere attempt at modesty. My friends did all the fighting. But it was thy brave denunciation which uncovered the foul plot, she persisted. And virgins will sing of the nobility with which... Thou protected the identity of thy nameless and misguided friend. Virgin was not a word with which Garion was prepared to deal. He blushed and floundered helplessly. Art thou in truth noble, Garion, the grandson of eternal Belgarath? The relationship is a bit more distant. We simplify it for the sake of convenience. 
But thou art in his direct line, she persisted, her violet eyes glowing. He tells me I am. Is the Lady Pulgara, perchance, thy mother, my aunt? A close kinship, nonetheless. She approved warmly, her hand coming to rest lightly on his wrist. Thy blood, Lord Garion, is the noblest in the world. Tell me, art thou perchance at yet unbetrothed? Garion blinked at her, his ears growing suddenly redder. Ah, uh, Garion, Mandarallan boomed in his hearty voice, driding into the awkward comment. I had been seeking thee. Will thou excuse us, Countess? The young lady shot Mandarallan a look filled with sheer venom, but the knight's firm hand was already drawing Garion away. We will speak again, Lord Garion, she called after him. I hope so, my lady, Garion replied back over his shoulder. Then he and Mandarallan merged with the crowd of courtiers near the center of the throne room. I wanted to thank you, Mandarallan, Garion said finally, struggling with it a little. For what, lad? You knew whom I was protecting when I told the king about Natchak, didn't you? Naturally, the knight replied in a rather offhand way. You could have told the king. Actually, it was your duty to tell him, wasn't it? But thou hast given thy pledge. You hadn't, though. Thou art my companion, lad. Thy pledge is as binding upon me as it is upon thee. Didst thou not know that? Garion was startled by Mandarallan's words. The exquisite involvement of Arendish ethics was beyond his grasp. So you fought for me instead. Mandarallan laughed easily. Of course, he answered. Though I must confess to thee, in all honesty, Garion, that my eagerness to stand as thy champion grew not entirely out of friendship. In truth, I found the Murgo Natchak offensive, and I liked not the cold arrogance of his hirelings. I was inclined toward battle before thy need of championing presented itself. Perhaps it is I who should thank thee for providing the opportunity. I don't understand you at all, Mandarallan. Garion admitted, sometimes I think you're the most complicated man I've ever met. I? Mandarallan seemed amazed. I am the simplest of men. He looked around then and leaned slightly toward Garion. I must advise thee to have a care in my speech with Countess Vassarana, he warned. It was that which impelled me to draw thee aside. Who? The comely young lady with whom thou wert speaking... She considers herself the greatest beauty in the kingdom, and is seeking a husband worthy of her. Husband? Gary responded in a faltering voice. Thou art fair game, lad. Thy blood is noble beyond measure by reason of thy kinship to Belgarath. Thou wouldst make a great prize for the countess. Husband? Gary quavered again, his knees beginning to tremble. Me? I know not how things stand in Misty Sandaria, Mandarlin declared. But in Arendia, thou art of marriageable age. Guard well thy speech, lad. The most innocent remark can be viewed as a promise, should a noble choose to take it so. Garion swallowed hard and looked around apprehensively. After that, he did his best to hide. His nerves, he felt, were not up for any more shocks. The Countess Vassarana, however, proved to be a skilled huntress. With appalling determination, she tracked him down and pinned him in another embrasure with smoldering eyes and heaving bosom. Now, perchance we may continue our most interesting discussion, Lord Garion, she purred at him. Garion was considering flight when Aunt Paul, accompanied by a now radiant Queen Meazerana, re-entered the throne room. Mandarallan spoke briefly to her, and she immediately crossed to the spot where the violet-eyed countess held Garion captive. Garion, dear, she said as she approached, it's time for your medicine. Medicine? he replied, confused. A most forgetful boy, she told the countess. Probably it was all the excitement, but he knows that if he doesn't take the potion every three hours, the madness will return. Madness? the countess Vassarana repeated sharply. The curse of his family, Aunt Paul sighed. They all have it, all the male children. The potion works for a while, but of course it's only temporary. We'll have to find some patient and self-sacrificing lady soon, 
so that he can marry and father children before his brains begin to soften. After that, his poor wife will be doomed to spend the rest of her days caring for him. She looked critically at the young countess. I wonder, she said, could it be that you are as yet unbetrothed? You appear to be of a suitable age. She reached out and briefly took hold of Vasrana's rounded arm. Nice and strong, she said approvingly. I'll speak to my father, Lord Belgarath, about this immediately. The countess began to back away, her eyes wide. Come back, Aunt Paul told her. His fits won't start for s several minutes yet. The girl fled. Can't you ever stay out of trouble? Aunt Paul demanded of Garion, leading him firmly away. But I didn't do anything, he objected. Mandarallan joined them, grinning broadly. I perceive that thou hath routed our predatory countess, my lady. I should have thought she would prove more persistent. I gave her something to worry about. It dampened her enthusiasm for matrimony. What matter dost thou discuss with our queen? He asked. I have not seen her smile so in years. Meazarana's had a problem of a female nature. I don't think you'd understand. Her inability to carry a child to term. Don't errands have anything better to do than gossip about things that don't concern them? Why don't you go find another fight instead of asking intimate questions? The matter is of great concern to us all, my lady, Mandarel, and apologized. If our queen does not produce an heir to the throne, we stand in danger of a dynastic war. All Arendia could go up in flames. There aren't going to be any flames, Mandarel. Fortunately, I arrived in time, though it was very close. You'll have a crown's prince before winter. Is it possible? Would you like all the details? She asked pointedly. I've noticed that men usually prefer not to know about the exact mechanics involved in childbearing. Mandarallan's face slowly flushed. I will accept thy assurances, Lady Polgara, he replied quickly. I'm so glad. I must inform the king, he declared. You must mind your own business, Sir Mandarallan. The queen will tell Corridolan what he needs to know. Why don't you go clean off your armor? You look as if you just walked through a slaughterhouse. He bowed, still blushing, and moved away. Men, she said to his retreating back. Then she turned back to Garion. I hear that you've been busy. I had to warn the king, he replied. You seem to have an absolute genius for getting mixed up in this sort of thing. Why didn't you tell me or your grandfather? I promised that I wouldn't say anything. Garion, she said firmly, under our present circumstances, secrets are very dangerous. You knew that what Lelderin told you was important, didn't you? I didn't say it was Lelderin. She gave him a withering look. Garion, dear, she told him bluntly, don't ever make the mistake of thinking that I'm stupid. I did it, he floundered. I wasn't, I... Aunt Paul, I gave them my word that I wouldn't tell anybody. She sighed. We've got to get you out of Arendia, she declared. This place seems to be affecting your good sense. The next time you feel the urge to make one of these startling public announcements, talk it over with me first, all right? Yes, ma'am, he mumbled, embarrassed. Oh, Garion, what am I ever going to do with you? Then she laughed fondly and put her arms around his shoulder, and everything was all right again. The evening passed uneventfully after that. The banquet was tedious, and the toasts afterwards interminable as each arendish noble arose and turned to salute Mr. Wolf and Aunt Paul with flowery and formal speeches. They went to bed late, and Garion slept fitfully, troubled by nightmares of hot-eyed count pursuing him through endless flower strewn corridors. They were up early the next morning, and after breaking yeah, and after breakfast, Aunt Paul and Mr. Wolf spoke privately with the king and queen again. Garion, still nervous about his encounter with Countess Vassarana, stayed close to Mandarallan. The Membrate Knight seemed best equipped to help him avoid any more such adventures. They waited in an antechamber to the throne room, and Mandarallan, in his blue surcoat, explained at length an intricate tapestry which covered an entire wall. 
About mid-morning, Sir Anderig, the dark-haired knight Mr. Wolf had ordered to spend his days caring for the tree in the plaza, came looking for Mandarolin. Sir Knight, he said respectfully, the Baron of Vo Ebor hath arrived from the north accompanied by his lady. They have asked after thee and besought me that I should seek thee out for them. Thou art most kind, Sir Anderig, Mandorlin replied, rising quickly from the bench where he had been sitting. Thy courtesy becomes thee greatly. Anderig sighed. Alas, that is... It was not always so. I have that this past night stood vigil before the miraculous tree which holy Belgarath commended me to my care. I thus had leisure to consider my life in retrospect. I have not been an, an admirable man. Bitterly I s repent my faults and will strive earnestly for amendment. Wordlessly, Mandor Mandorolin clasped the knight's hand and then followed him down a long hallway to a room where the visitors waited. It was not until they entered the sunlit room that Garion remembered that the wife of the, Varen, the Baron of Vo Ebor was the lady to whom Mandorolin had spoken on the windswept hill beside the Great West Road some days before. The Baron was a solid-looking man in a green surcoat, and his hair and beard were touched with white. His eyes were deep-set, and there seemed to be a great sadness in them. Mandorolin, he said, warmly embracing the younger knight. Thou art unkind to absent thyself from us for so long. Duty, my lord, Mandorolin replied in a subdued voice. Come, Nerina, the baron told his wife. Greet our friend. The baroness Nerina was much younger than her husband. Her hair was dark and very long. She, ro she wore a rose-colored gown, and she was beautiful, though Garion thought no more so than any of the half-dozen others he had seen at the Arendish court. Dear Mandarolin, she said, kissing the knight with a brief, chaste embrace, we have missed thee at Vo Ebor, and the world is desolate for me that I must absent from its well-loved halls. Sir Anderig had bowed and then discreetly departed, leaving Garion standing awkwardly near the door. And who is this likely-appearing lad who accompanies thee, my son? the baron asked. A Sandarian boy, Mandarolin responded. His name is Garion. He and diverse others have joined with me in a perilous quest. Joyfully I greet my son's companion, the baron declared. Garion bowed, but his mind raced, attempting to find some legitimate excuse to leave. The situation was terribly embarrassing, and he did not want to stay. I must wait upon the king, the baron announced. Custom and courtesy demand that I present myself to him as soon as possible upon my arrival at his court. Wilt thou, Mandarolin, remain here with my baroness until I return? I will, my lord. I'll take you to where the king is meeting with my aunt and my grandfather, sir, Garin offered quickly. Nay, lad, baron demurred. Thou art to remain... Though I have no cause for anxiety, knowing full well the fidelity of my wife and my dearest friend, idle tongues would make scandal were they left together unattended. Prudent folk leave no possible foundation for false rumor and vile innuendo. I'll stay then, sir, Garin replied quickly. Good lad, the baron approved. Then, with eyes that seemed somehow haunted, he quickly left the room. Wilt thou sit, my lady? Mandarol and asked Narina, pointing to a sculptured bench near a window. I will, she said. Our journey was fatiguing. It is a long way from Vo Ebor, Mandorlin agreed, sitting on another bench. Didst thou and my lord find the roads passable? Perhaps not yet so dry as to make travel enjoyable, she told him. They spoke at some length about roads and weather, sitting not far from each other but not so close that anyone chancing to pass by the open door could have mistaken their conversation for anything less than innocent their eyes however spoke more intimately garion painfully embarrassed stood looking out a window carefully choosing one that kept him in full view of the door as the conversation progressed there were increasingly long pauses and garion cringed inwardly as each agonizing silence, afraid that either Mandarolin or the Lady Narina might, in the extremity of their hopeless love, cross that unspoken 
boundary and blurt that one word, phrase, or sentence which would cause restraint and honor to crumble and turn their lives into disaster. And yet, a certain part of his mind wished that the word or phrase or sentence might be spoken and that their love could flame, however briefly. It was there, in that quiet sunlit chamber, that Garion passed a small crossroad. The prejudice against Mandarolin that Lelderin unthinking passionship had instilled in him finally shattered and fell away. He felt a surge of feeling, not pity, for that would not have he would not have accepted pity, but compassion rather. More than that, there was the faint beginning of an understanding of the honor and towering pride which though utterly selfless, was the foundation of the tragedy which had existed in Arendia for uncounted centuries. For perhaps a half hour more, Mandarolin and the Lady Narina sat, speaking hardly at all now, their eyes lost in each other's faces, while Garion, near to tears, stood his enforced watch over them, and then Dernick came to tell them that Aunt Paul and Mr. Wolf were getting ready to leave.